Good evening. My name is Daniel Sanders from Maccabi, Canada, and welcome to tonight's conversation with Eric Holtz. Eric Holtz is the current manager for the Israeli national baseball team set to compete at the Tokyo Olympics in 2021. Holtz managed Team Israel in all the qualification tournaments leading to the games, which included statement wins over Germany in Germany, as well as baseball powerhouse in the Netherlands. Prior to taking the helm of Team Israel, he was an assistant coach at Manhattanville College and Westchester Community College, as well as he is a proud Maccabee Games alumni, serving as the assistant coach for Team USA en route to their gold medal in 2013. And he earned another gold while coaching the American under-18 team at the 2017 Maccabee Games. But before we bring in Coach Holtz, I'd like to introduce my special co-host for the evening, Olympic silver medalist, Dylan Moskovich. Hey, hey Dylan, how are you? I'm great, I'm great, how are you doing? Doing great. So now you're here, Dylan. Let's welcome Coach Holtz in the only way we know how, by showing the moment they clinched a berth in the 2020 Olympic Games. Derek Bayless delivers, Danny Valencia hits it high and deep to left field. This ball's way back there and this ball is gone. A three run bomb for Valencia and Israel has a 10 run lead in the top of the eighth. They're three outs away from going to the Olympics. No doubt about that when all you had to do was watch Andrew Norman, the left fielder, who turned around and gazed up into the sky. Right-hander is working quickly, and he comes home. And this ball's flown out to right field. Simon Rosenbaum reaches up, and that's the out that ends it. We could say it, it's official next year in Tokyo. Israel's going to the Olympic Games. Awesome, awesome video. I had chills watching it again. It's been it's been too long, man. <laughs> so uh, first off, how are you? How are your family doing during uh, this unprecedented pandemic? Thank you. Um, I'm doing, you know, really well. Uh, you know, obviously considering what's going on. Um, thank you. You know, my family also is is doing, uh, you know, pretty well through this. Uh, my daughter. Um, is a pediatric oncology nurse uh, in New York City. Uh, some days she's dealing with uh, oncology and COVID patients. Uh, so she's kind of right in the middle of all this craziness, but uh, everybody's doing well and, and just real happy to be here with you guys. Thank you for joining us tonight. So uh, let's go back to before the qualification of the Olympics. You weren't the manager of the 2017 World Baseball Classic, but I'm sure you watched it quite closely. Israel was 41st ranked in the world. That definitely was the spark for baseball in Israel, for a momentum, for, for what we see today. So how do you think that tournament and the momentum from that helped the journey to uh, where we are now? So I'm going to go back even a little bit before that, Dan, if you don't mind. Um, the way this really kind of started was um, truly when Peter Kurz asked me to take over as the, the head coach of the Israeli national team uh, was when he found out that I was coming back for uh, the Maccabi Games in 2017. Uh, in 2017, the U.S. won a gold medal on Tuesday. Wednesday, I became the head coach of Team Israel. And... I had a week to train these guys and then literally get on a plane and go to Serbia. And with a pretty good team, not a great team, uh, we lost to Austria in the championship of the B-Pole. 
And it was after that that Peter and I kind of sat down and trying to figure out what it would take, um, you know, from, from, from an arsenal of players to be able to compete. Then the World Baseball Classic happened. So these guys did so well at the World Baseball Classic. Um, it was just kind of a natural to see if these guys were interested in being part of the Olympic run and going through the process of making Aliyah to be able to do so. So it was definitely the momentum of the World Baseball Classic um, that, that, that definitely got the interest of some of the players to, to, to want to go to the next step. And and commit to going through the process of Aliyah. What what's the what's the process like for you when you're determining um, you know finding these players that come from various backgrounds, live in different places, play different you know in different on different teams, they've been brought up in a different system. How do you combine these athletes to make a team that you know will be the most cohesive possible and the most um, Dylan, Dylan, that's a great question. I, you know, in 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 baseball, as in it, a lot of different sports, um, there's a lot of different things that you do to marry. Um, and and cohesive is a great word to use, but it starts with um, recruiting, and and whether it's word of mouth or whether it's scouring, uh, you know, the analytic part of baseball today and talking to uh, minor league and major league scouts, um, talking to college coaches, uh, talking to guys um, who have been involved, but maybe not as involved um, uh, in Judaism. Um, and, and, and is it something that they, you know, want to get into from there? Not unlike anything else, you know, then we put everybody together uh, positionally. And and try to figure out, you know, what our best uh, case scenario is. You know, how many how many uh, starters do I have? How many lefties do I have? How many relievers do I have? How many games are we going to play in a day so I know how many position players uh, we need? How many catchers? How many corner infielders? Um, so it's really kind of put together, no different than any other baseball team, uh, just different being Jewish. And 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 finding them early enough because again they have to uh, go through the process of making Aliyah to be able to be eligible to to compete uh, in the Olympics. Have you had interest in this whole process from players that wanted to participate but were not willing to make that commitment to make Aliyah? Um, there were a couple of guys that, it, and again, I don't know that it was, wasn't that they didn't have interest, you know, they might've been at a, a weird time in their careers where they couldn't take the time off. Um, the process itself is, is a lengthy process. It, it, it takes a couple months, uh, to get all the paperwork and the background checks and the FBI stuff done. Then you literally have to go to Israel, spend some time there, uh, speak to the ministry and, and, and be interviewed by, uh, you know, all the proper authorities in Israel. And, and certain guys just didn't have the time to be able to, to dedicate to doing that. Um, what this process did do was take a lot of guys that may not have grown up in, in heavily Jewish homes and it really reconnected a lot of these guys that did go through this, um, you know, to their heritage and, 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 and you know, their, their, their family's history, which is really, really cool. And, and we could talk about that later, uh, you know, where, you know, it was incredibly difficult to find. We had a couple kosher you know, guys on the team. Um, it was incredibly difficult to find um, kosher food, let's say, in Lithuania. And Jordy, who's the current president of the uh, IAB, the Israel Association of Baseball, found like a, a Chabad 100 miles from the hotel so that we could have like Shabbat dinner together. And these are guys that didn't grow up with a whole lot of Judaism in their house. So it made it really, really interesting for these guys. And then as Dylan talked about, that was just another part of kind of what just brought everybody together 
toward that common goal. Yeah, I was going to ask you because, I mean, with these kind of extenuating circumstances where you have to bond together in a very quick amount of time, turn around and become not just a baseball team, but a unit, a family. Do you ahead of time kind of have an idea who on the team is going to take those leadership roles? And, uh, you know, do you rely heavily on them stepping into those roles and making sure that they do, uh, you know, deliver as leaders and, and kind of bring that team together so that you guys can execute um, at once? Dylan, that's another great question. And, 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 you know, for me, as the head coach, you have to remember that when we get to Bulgaria, I have like two and a half days, three days to really get to know these guys before we start competition. So the personality and the leadership type thing, it just happens. It, it Nobody... You know, nobody's made a captain. Nobody's made a leader. It's how you handle yourself, how the other players kind of look up to you or, or react toward you. Um, but we had guys step up in every facet of what this team needed, whether it was on the field, off the field, in the bullpen, um, you know, in the batting cages, on the field, in the hotel. Uh, we have one guy that really spends a lot of time um, you know, doing visualization and meditation. So each guy kind of found their own niche within the team. Um, the one thing I, I think that's probably one of the, the my best traits as a coach is I make it clear to everybody, and this isn't just Team Israel, this is just me as a coach, that nobody's bigger than the team or the game. And, um, you know, everybody is going to get the same respect that they give. And uh, the, the players just kind of feed off of, you know, that type of positivity for me and that type of energy for me. And then you would see a different guy kind of just, you know, step up every day. You know, you just touched on something saying that nobody is bigger than the team, but you're going to the Olympics. You're wearing the Star of David on your chest. You're walking on the Israeli flag. Jews, we don't have the greatest, you know, love affair with a lot of the world. And there's a lot of pressure on them in all facets of life. And in the Olympics, when there are only six teams in this tournament, there's a lot more that these players and you as a manager are going to have to deal with than just baseball. So is that, does that play a role in your mindset? Does that play a role in your conversation with the players and how you prepare for the uh, tournament? Um, absolutely not. Um, I cannot tell you how proud I am to wear this color and this shirt and this logo on my chest um, to show the entire world. Now, we couldn't do that in Bulgaria. We couldn't do that in Lithuania. We couldn't do that in Germany. And we were very limited to what we were able to wear when we weren't on a field uh, because we are Israel and we are Jewish. For me, that's what makes this even more special that a country the size of New Jersey, who, you know, has been treated, you know, not always the most uh, positively, in, you know, throughout the, the, the history, is one of six teams that, and we were the first to actually qualify, right? Japan, because they're the host and then the number one team in the world as far as rankings, but little Israel, who people looked at kind of like the Jamaican bobsled team was the first team to qualify. And, and, you know, our guys couldn't be more proud. We will not let anything, including that deter us from what our job is. And our job is to represent Israel in the most positive fashion and to show people that we are building baseball in Israel. And, and you know, th th those are our goals. I mean, you know, you, we can talk about the game and how I approach the game, but for me to have little kids in Israel, watching these guys 
represent their country and saying, you know what, one day that could be me, then then I'm the happiest guy going. What better motivator too? You know, I for myself when I went to Sochi, I was um, I was the only uh, identifying Canadian um, Jewish athlete on a team of about 220. Uh, it was a um, before I I went to the games. I had a I didn't grow up with a ton of um, Jewish friends. I had some, but you know, figure skating is not a very popular <laughs> sport in the Jewish world. Um, but I, you know, I had people contacting me throughout the Jewish community and I had gone to birthright already and, and kind of made a connection to more of my Jewish heritage and, um, and to Israel. What, what a great <clears throat> opportunity for these players to be able to not only represent Israel on their Jersey, but also to do it together and to, you know, for you to be able to create, uh, a culture and an environment, um, where everyone feels proud to to de- not only defeat those odds, but to show the world that, you know, we are baseball too, and we're here. And, and I mean, kudos to you to, to be able to lead that team and, and to make them feel that, that pride. No, I appreciate it. You know, one of the, one of the great things for me, um, you know, we have some big time guys on the team right now. You know, one of my favorite stories truly is nine-year MLB veteran Danny Valencia. Danny Valencia, like, he never really um, was known for being Jewish. Um, You know, there aren't a whole lot of MLB players that are Jewish. I keep um, a picture of Danny's bar mitzvah photo on my phone, and... You know, I then found out that Danny grew up a practicing Jew. His father, um, you know, was Spanish. His mom is Jewish. And he is a practicing Jew. So for him and for guys like him who may have been like you in Sochi, you know, like one or a few, that's kind of the beauty. Like, we're all Jewish. Everybody here is Jewish. And we share that. And it's okay um, for us to talk about it and we're proud and we're sticking our chests out and some guys are a little bit crazy, but we're, we're, we're that together. So the 24 man roster and the coaches and everybody is wearing that Israel, like loud and proud and we're together. So you had the chance to wear the Israel loud and proud, as you said, in Germany and you beat team Germany. So what was that like playing in that country and of course beating the home team? So this is one of my favorite stories, Dan. I'm going to have to take a little time here to explain. As much as you want. If if that's okay. So we started out in Bulgaria and in Bulgaria, we were still in what's called the B pool. So there's an A pool, B pool and a C pool. Israel was in the C, we got to the B. We lost in the championship to Austria in 2017. So we're in the B, hoping to get a shot to go to the A, which is in Germany. All we did was go 6-0 in Bulgaria against some real tough teams, Greece, and and we beat Russia uh, twice. Uh, Russia, uh, we we later found out, used, I want to say, five or six Cuban nationals who were given um, uh, Russian nationalist status, which was kind of phony. We found out months later, even with Cubans, we beat them twice. Um, We go to Lithuania to play a two out of three. We beat Lithuania pretty badly. I mean, it was two games. If I remember correctly, it was like 13-1 and 15-nothing. And Now we're in Germany, and Germany is 12 teams, five make it to the Olympic qualifier in Italy. So the way our schedule kind of worked out, um, we won uh, the first three games, and now we have Germany. So with 3-0, I think we'd be Great Britain, Sweden, And off the top of my head, I can't think of the other team right now who we beat early, um, but we have Germany. 
Now, the atmosphere in Germany, there are thousands of people. Um, I've never been to a baseball game, like a baseball game in Europe. Um, in between pitches, there is rave music blasting. I mean, blasting. I have video somewhere on my phone. I could send it to you. It's insane. Like the crowd is just constantly pulsing and waiting for something to happen. And for me, you know, at 54 years old, um, obviously, you know, the, the, the World War II and the Holocaust and, 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 just to be Jewish and to be allowed to be in Germany competing against Germany, like, like it gives you chills, right? We walk into the stadium to play Germany. They're the host team. It's like Darth Vader and Star Wars, right? Like they're wearing their black jerseys and this music's playing. And you look up and, you know, not to be creepy, the stadium um, was sponsored by the Bonn. So we were in Bonn, Germany, the Bonn Gas Company. Think about that for a second, okay? So here, right, you got a team full of Jewish guys playing against Team Germany. And, and and you know, the field is sponsored by this. Like, like this, really? Is this really happening? And I turn around, and let's say there's like four or 5,000 people there. There's three people sitting in the stands wearing Team Israel baseball. The fact that they were allowed to be there is incredible, right? We go into the last inning. We're tied 2-2. Germany leads off the top of the 10th on a ball that was kind of misplayed uh, by one of the outfielders. So what should have been kind of a routine single, he dove, the ball got by him, man on third, nobody out. Man on third, nobody out. We bring in a closer, John DeMarty. This guy is just, just special. Runner on third, nobody out. I say it again, runner on third, nobody out. John, like, gets the first two guys, you know, to strike out in, you know, like a, a ground ball. We get out of it. The bottom of the 10th, we walk off on Germany. In Germany, thousands of people just sitting there in disbelief. Little Israel came to Germany and beat Germany on their own soil in the Bonn Gas Company Stadium field. I, I'm sorry I don't have it with me because I keep it in my office, but through this entire run, that is the only baseball, the only game ball that I kept for myself. And, and it's just the final score and the date. And and that game ended. And, and my daughter, I, who I didn't mention, was also – Team Israel's nurse, we just hugged and and the chills and and it wasn't just a baseball game, man. Like like to have this opportunity. Um, I neither one of my parents are here; they, they, they're both gone. Um, it was something that just filled your heart. It was like you were playing for more than just this game. You were playing for all these people. And, and to have that opportunity made this just incredible. Wow. Wow. <laughs> I, yeah, I mean, yeah. listen, so, so, so I know I, it really, you know, and, and when I think about it still, I get chills. Um, We're I all a, getting chills. I'm a pretty emotional guy to begin with uh, when I think about stuff like that you know, again, and how heavy that was for me, uh, hearing Hatikva played in Germany. Like, like you know, th this is insane. This is crazy. Um, so, yeah, that was definitely, you know, one of the highlights um, through the process. And like I said, you know, for me, it's just, you know, something that, that you know, again, I'm not calling us heroes. We're not heroes. We're baseball players. But at that moment, 
uh, after the game and, and on the on the bus going back to the hotel, I tried to explain to the players. Now, obviously, they all know about World War II and the Holocaust and the six million that were lost. But when I broke it down and we talked about the relevance for the Jewish community and how cool this was, like th th this feeling of euphoria kind of sunk in. And I'm not saying they got melancholy, but it hit these guys because they're kids, you know, they're, they're in their 20s. And, and, and for Coach, who's, I'm a goofy guy. I'm always messing with the guys. So for me to kind of, you know, make it a little bit heavier for them, it was kind of like, wow. And, and I, you know, when we talk about stuff like that, when we have team meetings, um, you know, guys that go back to that is just one of the special occasions that the, the team shared together. Did you did you find that that um, that win and that experience was pivotal for the team? Like, did you see? Obviously, you guys were on a run. You were doing things right. I mean, you were three and zero going into that game. But did you see things level up? Did you see this kind of added burst of inspiration moving forward in the tournament? Dylan, you know. So let me tell you what happened after that, right? We're sitting with the coaches that night, and we start talking about, hey, guys, we're 4-0. We're guaranteed fifth place. We're going to Italy. And we look at each other, and, and is that so, Really? So what happens now is we won the first four games, but now we have the three best teams to play. So although we're feeling really good, the next game was, um, I want to say, um, after Germany came, now nah, was it the Netherlands? Oh, Spain. It was Luis Soho. Uh, Luis Soho's Spain team, and, you know, we kind of talked uh, amongst the coaches, and, and we just said, you know, there's not a – like, nobody ever coaches to lose, but we're not going to show them our best. And and we went out, and it was competitive for a while. Uh, Spain ended up beating us. I, I, I think the score was 16-9 that day. And um, it was kind of like a mid softball game. There were just home runs being hit and so on and so forth. Now, we get to Italy. Who do we have game one? Spain. They're looking past us. All we do is throw Joey Wagman on the mound, who throws a complete game shutout. We beat him 3-0. We go from losing 16 to 9 six days later to beating Spain 3 0 in game one in the Olympic qualifier. Okay. Spain beats us 16 9. The next day, we have the Netherlands, the European champion, Netherlands, eighth in the world, ninth in the world. I mean, these guys are just talented up and down, man. They put it on us too uh, in. Uh, in, in Germany, I think they beat us like 13 to four. Um, now we get to Italy and we have just beaten Spain three, nothing. And we have the Netherlands. Here's a great story. One of my pitchers, John Muscat, who, uh, ex Cincinnati Reds guy, his arms not feeling great. And I called, I, I, I don't know if I DM'd him or, you know, I texted him, called him, whatever. And I said, Hey Johnny, um, I need you in relief tomorrow. He says, Holtzy, can I come down to your room? I need to talk to you. So he comes down to my room. He says, Holtzy, I don't know how many bullets I have left in the chamber. My arm's not feeling good. I'm hurting, dude. Every pitch may be my last pitch. That's kind of how I'm living right now. I don't want to waste those bullets in relief. I want the ball against the Netherlands. I'm going to give you everything I got. And if Everything I got is the last time I ever play this game. I'm going to leave it out on the field. So this is a guy who's just given me potentially the last appearance of his career. 
All he does after we had lost 13 to four, five days later, is go out and throw four and two thirds, one run. We go on to beat the eighth ranked team in the world, eight to one, after they had just beaten us 13 to four. I mean, what what do you say about that? You know, as a as a as a coach, you know, this guy literally, when you talk about leaving it out on the field, Dylan, leaving it out on the ice, why are you gonna save anything? And this guy gave us everything. Now we are playing in the last game of Germany. We have Italy. Italy's a, an unbelievable team professional. They got eight coaches. They have an advanced scouting system. They're watching all of our games. Great ball game. I want to say it's like 3-2 us. They tie it 3-3 late and they end up walking off on us 4-3. So we get out of Germany 4-3, which was good enough for fifth place. Game three in the Olympic qualifiers, we have Italy. So now it's like kind of a repeat of Germany in Germany. We have Italy in Italy. It's a night game. There's fans, places going crazy. And it's a 2-2 baseball game. It's the eighth inning. It's getting late. We get a runner on. And I don't remember how if, how we moved them over, but I, I do remember it was first and third, one out. Mitch Glasser lays down one of the greatest safety squeezes I've ever seen in my life. The first baseman comes and charges, picks it up and bobbles it. We score a run. They bring in this guy named Pat Venditti. Who's Pat Venditti? I know who he is because I'm in baseball. Pat Venditti is a minor league pitcher who pitches righty and lefty. He's an ambidextrous <laughs> professional pitcher. I've always wanted to see him. I just never wanted to see him against me. We go on to score five runs off Venditti. We just beat Italy eight to two in Italy. Holy crap. We're three and oh. We just beat the best three teams that just beat our asses less than a week ago in Germany. And who do we have left? The Czech Republic, who we beat in Germany, and South Africa, who we know nothing about. All we got to do is beat Czech Republic. All we got to do is beat them, and we clinch the Olympics. Well, anyone that loves baseball knows better. The Czech Republic showed up that, that next night, and they had our number. Bad. We'd score one, they'd score two. Their pitcher, anytime we got anything going, they would just shut it down. And before you knew it, they had one big inning. I'm going to say they scored four or five runs. It was one big inning, and we just – couldn't come back that night. Final score was Czech Republic 7, Israel 4. Now, we are the only team in the Olympic qualifiers that controls our own destiny. Why? Because we beat the Netherlands, we beat Spain, we beat Italy. The Czech Republic had lost to one of them, so they would need us to lose again for them to have the head-to-head -head against us. So all we need to do is take care of South Africa. Well, we don't know a whole lot about it. So here's the only rah-rah that I gave to the guys. And true story. We're about five minutes away from the stadium, getting ready to play South Africa. The weather's bad. It's raining. What was supposed to be like a 5 p.m. game, they moved to 12 noon. Uh, so there weren't going to be a whole lot of fans there. And, and I'm telling you, they didn't they didn't let us take on-field batting practice. They were just scared that they weren't going to be able to get the game in. 
So we're on the bus and everybody's kind of there's like nervous energy. You know, you just can't tell how the guys are feeling right now. And it's about five minutes before we're getting ready to get to the stadium and get off the bus. And I stand up on the bus and very calmly, I just go, hey, boys. We are the only team in this entire tournament that controls our own destiny. All we have to do is take care of our business. And if we do that, we leave the hotel as a baseball team. And we come back as Olympians. And the bus just goes nuts. Like people are banging the windows and banging the roof. And poor South Africa never knew what hit them in. I mean, that game was over in the first inning. You know, we ended up gonging them in, in, in eight in you know, eight innings. I think we beat them eleven to one. And and I, I you know, like I said, you know, we took care of it early. We took care of it often. Uh, we scored a lot of runs early and 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 really kind of took the pressure off of uh, ourselves to to really kind of just be able to enjoy that baseball game because it was just they were never a threat to us in that particular game. And uh, and here we are, you know, in the now 2021 Tokyo Olympics. So you're the first Israeli team to qualify. For Olympic Games in '76, Montreal Games. How did it feel when you were back on that bus as Olympians? What was the atmosphere like? What was it like in the locker room? Take us to that moment. Uh, the locker room was crazy. I mean, listen, a, a lot of hugs, and uh, you know, Dylan talked about you know being a cohesive bunch. When you think about what we did, we took you know. 24 guys in a six week period and they became family. They became brothers. So the hugging and the celebrating and, you know, absolutely insane. Um, I don't know that the, uh, the weight of the Olympics really kind of set in. I mean, you know, it, it, listen, it's great. It's, it's, but until we kind of, you know, and, and, and what's unfortunate, like in any other uh, situation like this was, you know, we get back to the hotel and, and, and people are showering, we have dinner, and then literally we're leaving the next morning to come home. Some people didn't even have like time to say goodbye to each other because, you know, we're flying back to our, you know, um, our homes, which are all over the place. So I, I, you know, I don't want to speak for the guys, but I know for me, um, it took me a while uh, to be home. And it took me a while um, talking to friends of my, like, you know, my closest friends. Um, Cause for me, you know, again, I say, I'm just a baseball coach. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a coach that lets, you know, my players, handle their business and, 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 and at the end of the day, but it's Holtz, you're an Olympian. Holtz, you're going to the Olympics. And it took a while to really set in and, 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 and be okay to even talk about it because it was so far and such a crazy dream. When you think about our goal was just getting out of the B pole to compete in the A pool. Nobody took it seriously. All we wanted to do was get Israel to the April for the first time. So, you know, did this really happen? Like, you know, pinch me. And, it, you know, are, are, are we really doing this? And and the answer is yes. And, 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 you know, what makes it that much crazier is, you know, powerhouse countries like the USA, like Canada, um, still haven't. Um, qualified because of the pandemic, you know, a lot of the, the, the last two tournaments were pushed back and here's little Israel and we're waiting on whoever is going to be the last two teams to join us, which makes it crazy. So 
this crazy high happens. You guys know you're in the you're in the games. You're you know going to be Olympians once you set foot in that opening uh, opening ceremony stadium, which is uh, one of the greatest experiences you could have. Um, pandemic hits and everything changes, and sport is sports in general are on the bench. What do you do for these players to kind of keep that that spirit alive? enough that it's there but not that it's like burning out you know how do you keep these guys inspired and motivated but also seeing the big picture so um for the first couple of weeks when this started um i can't tell you the amount of interviews i was doing um you know about the olympics and and so on and so forth um so first things first right um as i told you guys off the air um, I had COVID-19. Uh, I had it March 21st. I had it for 10 days. I had every symptom of the virus except for the respiratory part. So I was down for 10, 11 days. Uh, again, for an older guy, I'm in good shape. I take care of myself. I work out all the time. Um, here's the bottom line. And, and this is what we talked about. And this is what I talk about as a coach. And this is what I talk about as a game coach. This is what I talk about with people in life and and trying to teach them life skills. Control what you control. Period. Everyone else is in the same predicament that we are. Every athlete is going through the same uh, lack of training, lack of facilities. But at the end of the day people are dying from the virus. So we can't lose fact, uh, lose perspective of the fact that as disappointing as it is, it's not like the Olympics was canceled. It was postponed. Now, what do we do? This is where the mental, the meditation, the visualization, Zoom, what I'm doing with you guys right now. We try to have a weekly uh, meeting with guys. And again, it's tough because I got guys in a million different time zones all over the country, all over the world. Um, but basically it's just to say, how you guys doing? How you feeling? Where, where's your head? What are you up to? Do you need help with anything? Um, you know, is, how's your arm feeling? You know, we'll have our trainers on with pitchers asking them what's going on. So we're doing the best we can. Um, When the guys found out that I was ill, I think that got them a little nervous, um, which, you know, just again, it kind of filled my heart that these guys really cared about me. And and, uh, um, so, you know, the guys were checking in just to make sure that, you know, everybody was okay. For the people that don't know, I live like 30 miles north of New York City. So kind of right in the epicenter of all this craziness. Um, But Dylan, you know, yeah, it's going to impact certain people. They're going to be a year older. Um, they're not going to have had training, live at bats, uh, competition. But again, nobody has. So it's trying, you know, and not to be corny. I don't want to sound like anybody's, you know, parents here. You know, <laughs> in, 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 <laughs> you, you, life throws you lemons, you make lemonade. In baseball, we say, you know, two-strike curveball, take it to right field. Everybody's doing the best that we can do in an absolute horrendous time. Um, And we're just hoping that, you know, everything just gets better for everybody and that we do have an opportunity to uh, be able to get on the field next year. Because if it got postponed after that, I'd be really nervous that, that it would get canceled. Fair enough. So, because of the Olympics, because you have, you know, players going all around the world, from all around the world, you're also having interest from other players. So you recently added uh, World Series champion, four-time All-Star Ian Kinsler to the roster. So first question is, how will he impact the team? But also, are you looking to add more players, add different players, younger players? How are you going to change the roster due to this delay with all the circumstances? So again, Danny, um, Not so easy to add players for several reasons. Um, One, uh, like we talked about prior, um, they need to make Aliyah. 
Um, so let's say, you know, we found a guy and, um, you know, we need to make sure that we would have enough time um, to get them uh, through the process and, and confirmed. I want to say it's like six months. You, you have to be a, a citizen of the country you're representing for at least six months. It may be a year, but at least six months prior. Um, it makes it very difficult. You know, other countries have the same uh, uh, standards that they have to live by, which makes this different than the World Baseball Classic. The World Baseball Classic is you basically just need to have heritage and you could be a citizen of that country. Here you have to win the Olympics. Um, so Ian Kinsler, when he retired, um, the paperwork and the Aliyah process, literally, when I tell you, worked and we got him in two days before they shut down the country of Israel due to COVID-19. Ian literally went to his interview with the ministry with a PPE mask on, got it, got in, got out, and, and he's done. Um, so it's not to say that we're not looking to fortify or change our roster. I'm very happy with where our roster is right now, um, but we're always looking at, you know, uh, you know of anybody and <laughs> if there's anybody that you can recommend. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're looking, um, Ian, how's Ian going to impact the team? Well, first and foremost, I'm going to tell you that Ian, um, is an incredible gentleman. He's a, an incredible gentleman. He's a proud Jew. Um, very happy to wear the Israel colors. Um, just, he was so disappointed that he couldn't spend more time in Israel working with the, the kids and doing clinics and stuff like that while he was there. Um, how's it going to impact the team? And, and you think I'm going to kind of be a wise ass by saying this, but I'm not, I don't mean to be funny in, in saying this. Ian's the rookie on this team. Okay. Now Ian's presence is going to be huge here from a leadership aspect um, he's a guy that's been there, you know, and, and World Series champions, like you said. Ian Kinsler's never been an Olympian, uh, so he's just like the rest of the players. Uh, he, you know, may, may have a little bit more credential, you know, uh, next to his name, uh, but we bust his chops all the time because he is a rookie. He's a rookie on Team Israel. Uh, we have a question for you from Dan Berlin. Um, is there any one particular coach that influenced your coaching style the most, either a former coach of yours or someone you've met or read about? And how okay. And impact how you coach Team Israel today? Sure. So, Dan, that's a that's a great question. Um, I think one of the most, if I am successful, I mean, you know, I, I, maybe I'm just successful because we're here, but I think one of the um, – the things about me, which a lot of people don't know, is at 54 years old, I still play baseball. Um, I play in collegiate leagues and I play in men's leagues, age appropriate. So I play 18 and over and I play 50 and over and like five different leagues, all different teams. Why am I telling you that? I know how hard this game is to play. I know how hard um, this game can be on you mentally and emotionally when things are going bad. Um, nobody, uh, makes errors on purpose. Nobody strikes out on purpose. Um, so for me, I've always been, you know, when a guy makes a mistake, instead of getting in his ass about it, I'm going to put an arm around him and we're going to talk a little bit and say, Hey, you know what? Next time I might try it this way. Um, with team Israel, Dan, uh, going back to your question, um, I think my style was probably more of the 96 or 98 Yankees, um, where I, I say I was kind of like a Joe Torre in as much as I knew I had really talented guys. They bought into what we were trying to do. They understood that I wasn't going to put up with anybody's ego at any level. And then I was just going to let them play. Um, I was going to make decisions when the decisions needed to be made. But other than that, 
the guys got to this level because they know how to play this game. And I wasn't going to um, stick my chest out and, and you know, have a, 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 an ego in any of this because, again, myself, I, I'm, I'm pretty much just looking to do what's best for the team to get us the win. Um, in my years doing this, I think one of my best attributes of coaching um, is you'll really never know if we're up 10 runs or down 10 runs. I don't get too high. I don't get too low. Um, I just try and, and, and um, you know, live in the moment, live in the pitch or, or this out or this inning. And, um, and I think the players feed off of that type of energy. Um, you know, if a coach is, is, is nervous and walking around pacing, the players are going to pick up on that. Um, and I think it's, you know, it, it works the other way as well, where, um, you know, the, the players will work off of positivity. And that's just, I don't think I modeled myself off of anybody, but I just think that's kind of the way I, I, I choose to, to live my life and coach. So you just mentioned before how you're playing baseball, you're in five leagues. I'm sure your wife loves that. Um, you also played baseball in Israel. What was that like? And then touch on for us, how do you think the success of Team Israel from the World Baseball Classic now to the Olympics will affect the growth of the sport uh, in the country the size of New Jersey? So um, I'm not embarrassed to tell you. I, 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 my, my father was uh, pretty religious. Uh, he passed away when I was 11 years old. I was bar mitzvahed uh, actually in Israel. Um, but I really didn't practice uh, Judaism um, in my house growing up. So for me in 2007 to spend 10 weeks in Israel and discover this magical place, this magical country, in addition to playing, I, I was drafted as a player coach, um, but in addition to getting to do what I love every day, you know, playing and coaching six days a week, um, you know, was just, was incredible. And, 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 you know, getting to see the history of, and, and, you know, um, you know, walking with Jesus walked and walking where Moses walked and listening to stories about, you know, King Solomon and the Maccabees, you know, the real, you know, the real Maccabees, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's heavy, you know, it's just a heavy place. Today, I tell you again, I'm still not religious. Um, I'm going to tell you I've become Zionist. I, you know, I'm just pro-Israel. I love Israel, um, uh, you know, and, and just so proud to be involved in this. Um, but it was it was a tremendous way for me to kind of get back to my roots and my history and and uh, and 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 reconnect with such a magical place in Israel. Um, for me. Israel baseball. So Israel baseball today means that there are about a thousand kids total within the country playing uh, baseball. Um, they play softball as well. Um, the World Baseball Classic, I think, um, definitely helped somewhat. I think the Olympics is bigger. And why do I say that? Not because I'm involved in it, because these are actual citizens of Israel. They are passport holders of Israel. And, you know, for me, I, I, I truly, like, nothing would make me happier to tell you that because of this incredible run, that two years from now, instead of 1,000 kids, there are 1,500, 1,800, 2,000. And every two, three years, they can double the amount of interest that they're getting in Israel baseball. That to me would say that this has all been for the right reason. And this has all been really successful. Um, there were two guys running Israel baseball now at the, at the grassroots level, Yaniv Rosenfeld and Ophir Katz. And what they're doing today, which is so big, is they're trying to introduce baseball at the kindergarten level in the school system. So like within a phys ed course in Israel, there may be like a baseball section, which never happened before. 
And, um, you know, so it's just real neat. It's, it, it's neat for me to get to go back to Israel a couple times a year and work with the little ones and, and start to train them. Uh, I work with the coaches as well. So I help the coaches on what I'd like to see them work on. Uh, and then just staying involved is, is, is awesome. Well, you know, I, I always say for me that my favorite thing about sport is it, is it brings people together. It gives people something to, to watch and to, to build hope from, you know, it really, it displays the, the upper echelon of the human potential when it comes to our spirit and our, our will. Um, and I think, you know, developing baseball in Israel is giving these young kids heroes to look up to and something to aspire to. And it not only puts more kids in baseball, but it makes them believe that, you know, the improbable is possible. And um, I think that that's such an incredible gift to give to the country because it really it really brings a culture and a, and a, a togetherness that I think sports is so spectacular at doing. Um, I do want to ask you, who do you think is Israel's biggest competition for Tokyo? Whoever will play in that day. I, I don't I don't get into that stuff, Dylan. Uh, I, I was in a big press conference and Japan, there was Japanese media there. And um, when they opened it up, and there, there must have been 40 or 50 media there. And when they opened it up, Japan asked the same question. And my answer to that, I swear to you, I mean, it's documented. I went, Japan, right? And he said, yeah. I go, are you guys even in this thing? And <laughs> we just had fun with it. You mentioned improbable. I got to give you one of the greatest things that Israel gave back to me. Up near the Galilee, which is northeast Israel, right on the border of Jordan and the Galilee. We got to go to a school and teach baseball. Doesn't sound like a big deal, right? In this school, go or enrolled are Jews, Arabs, and Bedouins. All in the same classrooms, all learning together, living together, loving each other. And we got to teach baseball to these kids. And now you talk to me about improbable. That to me made me the happiest person in the world. Because when people talk about improbability, you tell me where you can see a Jew, an Arab, and some Bedouins playing and learning together. And as a coach of a baseball team, we got to go into that school, spend time with them, teach them, talk to them. And it showed me, and I, I couldn't wait to share this on social media, that like anything else in this world, it's the adults that ruin it for kids. I mean, if we all lived like kids and thought like kids, the world would be a much better place. I think that's, you know, undisputed. Sure. <laughs> Thank you so much for your thoughts and for and for joining us. You know, it's been uh, such an honor and a pleasure to hear your stories. Um, and uh, we're so proud of uh, all of Team Israel and everything that you're doing for the country and the team. And so we wish you the best of luck. We hope everything, everyone in the world heals, obviously, and and uh, and things get back to normal. And then Israel gets back to kicking ass. You know, I, I really thank you guys for having me. It was a pleasure. I, I'd, love to, I'd love to do this again sometime. And, uh, you know, if anybody has any questions, you know, that they want to ask, you know, you can share my uh, email address with them privately if you'd like. And, uh, you know, when it comes to talking baseball, you know, my pleasure. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll talk until I got no more breath in my lungs. And, and if I can help anybody with anything, you let me know. And I'd love to see you guys again. You're awesome. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you guys.